It says we're live. So. <laughs> All right, yay, technology. All right, um, I guess we should get this going. Uh, it's got a little bit weird talking to the people that aren't here, uh, the audience. Thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Um, before we get going, I just wanna say a few things about the Cadmont Trail Association. Uh, the CTA is you know, organizing these events uh, and we're kind of the, the statewide advocacy group for backcountry skiers and riders in Vermont. Um, if you didn't know, the Catamount Trail is a 300 mile long backcountry ski trail. And then additionally, to take in care, we take we manage that. And in addition, we also work with our, our chapter partners to manage a variety of backcountry zones throughout the state. Uh, we are a membership supported organization. So I would recommend you take a, take a look at our site at catamounttrail.org and uh, consider becoming a member. You can join the Catamount Trail at large as, as a member, or you can choose, you can affiliate with any of our chapters. If you affiliate with the chapters, the chapter, you are both a chapter member and a Catamount Trail Association member, and a portion of your membership money goes directly to the chapters to support their efforts. Um, so check out our chapters, check out the Catamount Trail Association, um, and you can do all of that at catamounttrail.org. So tonight is the second episode of our Backcountry Show and Tell series, and tonight we're going to be talking about splitboarding gear. And we've got a great <clears throat> panel of guests here to share us, share with us all of their, uh, their knowledge and uh, their perspective and help us kind of wade through all of the different choices that might, you might have to make if you're just getting into split boarding. Uh, so right now, how about we go around and introduce ourselves? Um, I'll start. I'm Greg Mayno. I'm the Cadmont Trail Association Events Director and Communication Director. Um, I'm not actually a split boarder, so I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna be learning a lot here uh, just like the rest of you watching. Um, and so, yeah, so how about Per, how about you go? Uh, I'm Per DeVore, I'm from South Central Vermont around Killington Pico area. I've uh, been snowboarding since 96 or so and been splitboarding since about 2012. Um, basically got into splitboarding just to, um, to get off off the lifts and and to try try something new was getting a little bored with just uh lift served uh snowboarding and split boarding has certainly opened up um a variety of a variety of interests there and uh and got to meet a lot of really cool people too along the way awesome thank you uh mitch hey <laughs> mitch Robito. um i'm in burlington vermont um i wear a lot of hats in the Splitboard world tonight. I'm uh, representing Splitboard Vermont as a co-founder and a fellow co-founder Al Karam over here, socially distanced. Uh, he's answering questions for everyone tonight. So if you've got questions beyond what we're chatting about, throw them in the comments down below, and uh, he'll try to get you some answers or get you some resources. Um, I uh, also am a snowboard trainer at. Bolton Valley this season, and I have a background in USASA freestyle riding. I've been a backcountry person for a long time. I'm, uh, I don't like to admit this to my snowboard friends, but I also am a tele skier and an alpine tourer. So if it slides up or down snow, uh, you'll find me on it, but I, I'm primarily a split boarder. So excited to chat with everyone tonight. Nice, thanks Mitch. Uh, Kyle, how about you? Uh, hey guys, I'm Kyle Crichton. Uh, I am currently in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, kind of a nomad myself. I've been in Vermont, upstate New York, and everywhere in between. Uh, I'm a Weston ambassador with Pear, and I've uh, been splitboarding since 2015, snowboarding for probably about 20, 22 years or so now. I'm um, uh, just excited to be here and talk about some cool stuff. Awesome, thank you. And Danny. Hi guys, I'm Danny Sweet. Um, I'm from Fairfax, Vermont. Uh, I've been splitboarding for four years, two years seriously. I started out just like demoing and getting my feet wet. Um, and I'm an ambassador for OGE as well as Picture Organics. So definitely love those businesses and you know everybody loves OGE in Vermont. So definitely love supporting those guys. Great, <clears throat> thanks for being here. All right, so let's, let's start with one of the more expensive pieces of equipment. Let's start with the split board decks. Um, who wants to go first and share what you're riding this year and tell us a little bit about um, 
why you you've kind of chosen that piece of that this deck for this season. Well, Greg, or go ahead, Pear. Yeah. No, go ahead, Mitch. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll start uh, just because it gets me really excited. Um, <laughs> I'm on a Zion split board, which is a company that has almost no presence in the backcountry scene. They're actually a small independently owned freestyle snowboard company out of Vancouver. They've been making snowboards since the early 2000s. And I got to know the owner of the company who um, just is passionate about snowboards and he's not a backcountry rider, reached out to all of his backcountry friends and basically said, I wanna make a split board. Let's all collaborate and design a split board together. So it was, it was pretty cool, got to, chime in on graphics and shape and profile and to my cool. Western friends here on the call, it's actually produced in the same facility and it has the same uh, non-branded uh, top sheet that sheds ice and, <laughs> snow and everything. Um, but cool board, it's uh, a bit more directional powder oriented, traditional camber between the feet, really rise rocker tip and tail, uh, more it actually rides a bit more like a <coughs> directional twin it actually can ride switch pretty well big fat shovel in the front so you can float in snow and uh, um, yeah it's a cool board I will say as much as I love the fact that the top sheet sheds ice and water which keeps the weight way down when going uphill because you're not carrying all that sun-baked snow with you um, it does look like it got shot by a BB gun uh, near your uh, climbing bars. I don't know if you can see this in the camera, but um, kind of looks like it's been pelted. And that's, uh, I learned that the, the bottom of my touring poles, the black diamond uh, compactor poles, they are razor sharp out of the box. And uh, if you, if you go to push your climbing baskets down and the tip of the pole digs into that top sheet, it, it looks like you're like, putting a knife into wax and then just like peeling it up. So I kind of had to learn to hack and change it. I actually took the tip of my poles to an angle grinder because we don't really need crazy sharp pole tips here in Vermont and they, they work great, but yeah, that's my snowboard Zion FJ split. Awesome. Uh, Kyle, how about what are you riding this year? Uh, so I'm riding a backwoods, a Western backwoods. Grab this guy over here. I believe pear is riding one as well amongst the many others that are behind him. <laughs> uh, so Backwoods is a kind of powder specific board. It is also directional like Mitch's. Um, you know, so if you're not much of a freestyle kind of park style rider, you know, it's not really going to be great for riding switch. Uh, it is pretty nimble, playful uh, in powder. I've ridden it on groomers as well if i come out of certain places um it works okay but for the most part it is my my backcountry powder board and um yeah the the nose is going to kind of just automatically lift out um and we'll probably talk about this later but most split boards you're also going to set back for an extra little lift but that's my board now so quick question kyle you weston probably has a bunch of different boards and mm -hmm. why did you pick this one uh, <laughs> I actually picked it because someone told me to buy it at first, <laughs> that, that being Alex Showerman. Um, and she was right on the nose. Like I, I just put my feet in and was like, this is definitely a board I want to ride. Um, and I've fallen in love with it. I have a couple other, you know, Western boards on me, but that's, this is my go-to for almost everything. <laughs> awesome. And how about Danny, what are you on this, this year? Um, so I've been writing the Burton Antisocial because, you know, I'm antisocial out there. No joking. Um, <laughs> it is a progressive tapered shaped board. Uh, it creates uh, the directional camber and it creates like a nice float in the powder and deep snow. Um, I did size up on my split board. Um, I usually when I'm in like resort, I ride a 146. Um, and this is a 152. I uh, size up just because when I'm riding resorts, I'm usually just like playing around at the park, doing side hits. Um, and when I'm out in the backcountry, sometimes it's a little deeper. You don't have that groomed terrain. Um, so it gives it a little bit more flow. Nice. <clears throat> now, Danny, do you, how long have you been splitboarding? 
Um, I've been split boarding for four years, but like seriously for two years. Okay. Um, so I demoed before I actually got my setup. And have you had problems finding uh, boards that are appropriate, the appropriate length for you? Or is that, you know, I feel like we've run into at our split board festival. We've always run into issues with uh, women that are interested in split boarding and having an appropriate gear. And it seems like the more and more year after year shops are getting, or uh, manufacturers are getting a little bit better about providing this kind of equipment, but it definitely seems like it's one of those things that's a little bit tricky to track down sometimes. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's definitely one of those items. If you want it, you got to purchase it early. You can't wait on it. Um, luckily, I do have a significant other that works at Burton. Um, so it was a Christmas gift for me. Um, and, you know, it, splitboard gear is expensive. So it's pretty hard to find pretty good deals on splitboards too. And if there's a good deal, like on the internet, like Facebook market page or consignment sure. they go really quick so definitely want to be quick on the clicking if you want um gear for the season especially this season for sure and sizing up hasn't been a problem you've seen is it would you say it's been more beneficial for you to size up a little bit than kind of detrimental um, yeah, I definitely, like, even if it's a powder day, like, on a resort, I use a different board, um, so I'll size up, like, I have a board that's, like, specific for powder for resort riding, um, so I definitely feel more comfortable on a bigger board out in the backcountry than what I would with my smaller board, um, just because there is a lot of things that grab out, grab at you out there versus, um, you know, on the resort, it's, like, pretty like groomed and like, you know, you don't have like little things hiding underneath as much. Um, so it definitely helps me just keep above all of that. Nice. All right, Pear, you, let's do, since you're also Weston ambassador um, and it looks like you have a little bit of a quiver of boards behind you. Tell us a little bit about your, what's behind, what, what, you, what what's, what's there? And where, well, where, do you use, where do you use those? When do you, when do you select, when do you grab which board? Well, honestly, Greg, um, I, Kyle and I are riding the same uh, Western backwoods from, I want to say, two seasons, three seasons ago. Um, yeah. That's my daily driver, for sure. Um, I love the wood core. It's a just super natural feeling, big nose. Uh, I find that, you know, I, instead of changing out boards, a lot of times I'll slide my stance uh, especially on a powder board, I might slide up to, to the nose a little bit more when I'm on, if I'm going to be railing groomers or ice or something like that, or slide it the whole way back. And then I've got a little bit more float um, up front in the shovel there. <coughs> um, I, the, the backwoods, I can't say enough about the backwoods. I, I, same, same thing with um, Alex Showerman got me on that board. Uh, you know, it was, it, you, you get into something you like and, and you know you just like it i got the uh i got the carbon last year um from weston also i don't know the specs on it ben's gonna kill me but i it is light it is like it is probably a third of the width of a normal uh snowboard or split board i guess um so touring is amazing you can just blaze up stuff and you don't even feel it <laughs> on your feet um and then and it's a little bit uh, being you know, not fully carbon. It does have a wood core to it, but uh, having so much more carbon in it, it's a little bit stiffer than your normal wood core board. Um, so I find that it actually does a little bit better on, on groomers or icy stuff. It kind of holds a better edge to it. And then I went the whole way over this year and uh, Weston hooked me up with the 10th Mountain um, the 10th mountain is their big mountain board. Uh, I'm, I was finding that the tail, one of the, one of the things on the backwoods over at Tux in the spring, we'd go over and the tail just wasn't quite giving me as, as much uh, camber as I would have liked it. And this 10th mountain is, is all there. It's uh, all these boards are early rise rocker, camber underfoot. Uh, I think that that's a huge game changer, you know, coming from a kid that grew up on an original sin that had that much camber to it. Um, and, uh, and this early rise rocker is just, it's, it's a game changer. You're able to, uh, you know, to carve a little bit easier. You can move the board uh, just that much easier over the shovel, I find. 
Nice. Um, so I pulled up the catalog for uh, the carbon just to, because that is actually a pretty good thing to show to people. So to compare the regular backwoods to the carbon, so a 152 backwoods is about 5.74 pounds and a carbon is just about a pound lighter. Nice. Uh, which really, and we'll probably talk about traveling the backcountry. That makes a hell of a lot of difference. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so, so I have a quick question for you guys. So, uh, split board setups are pretty expensive. <clears throat> is it would is it possible for somebody to get a split board setup and run it at the resort and in the backcountry? I would think so. I I definitely when I when I got my first uh, board, which was a beat demo that I had bought for way too much money. <laughs> I rode it on the lift all the time first because I was super proud that I had a split board in southwestern Pennsylvania because who <laughs> else had one of those but uh, I wanted to dial in the setup and that was one of the easiest ways for me to dial in that setup is just to make a bunch of lift laps and then I was yeah. I, I was moving you know moving my feet around in between stuff to really dial it in that way you're not you know in the back of Bolton uh, Bolton Valley somewhere trying to get screws you know on a 30 degree day or something Sure. And, and, when you, and when you were on it, was it problematic? Did you notice any like major performance differences between like a solid board? I, I mean, find, I think. Was it, was it acceptable? I think that it's more than acceptable. I think that you've got a stiffer board because of uh, you've got inside edges on these guys and the way that your bindings lock it together. I'm riding Spark R&Ds and I saw Mitch's ride in Karakorum's the bindings, it, it kind of locks the two halves together more. You've got a bunch of levers and stuff in there as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's just as, just as much, a little bit heavier for sure. But, yeah. Okay. They're, the engineering on these boards is getting better and better every year to the point where they're riding almost one-to-one -to, -one to solids. Sure. There, there are some better. things that um, <laughs> yeah. I feel like when you ride resort, oh, sorry, Greg, did I cut you off? Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to ask you and Danny to weigh in as well. Yeah, I, so there's a couple things that I've noticed, whether it's like my own experience or with in my own split community, and that is when riding resort with these boards, you might actually experience some issues that you won't experience much in the backcountry. Notably, if you don't have Spark or Karakorum that really like suck the board together, there's this noticeable, I'm going to take my binding off just to show it. As you're in, in some sort of turn, you can get some flex in this direction. I don't know if you can see that inside edge moving mm -hmm. out. And a lot of that happens when the board is in that twist performance as kind of that front foot is engaging in the turn, the board twists and those two little edges can separate. And in the backcountry, rarely are you in such firm snow on a low edge angle that that would ever be an issue, but you may actually see people out there in the backcountry on the resort especially if they're on a volley puck system, they're running a, a pin that runs through the whole width of the board to create yeah. torsional stabilization. So that doesn't happen, but that also, you know, there's a lot of people can break that apart about actual like riding technique and everything on, on where that can happen. But I've noticed that. So it's something just to, to be aware of if you are riding resort and you're really getting into those tighter radius turns where you're on a, a bit of a lower edge angle where you've got a lot of pressure, a lot of twist, you might see that happen. Um, something else I will add that's sweet about riding resort uh, to what Pear was saying about just dialing in your equipment, you can like play with your equipment too. learn how your board ride switch, learn how your board mm -hmm. like split it in half and go ride the little mini tow rope and like learn how to use an edge and a split ski like the when the board is split in half it is not designed to go downhill with any sort of like intentional design but there's situations <laughs> where you have to split ski or and it's it's fun to be prepared and know how to do that i remember at splitboard festival a couple of years ago um you know we did a little mini split race which has happened you know pretty much every year but there was a section of that race where we were like take your skins off and split ski and it was hilarious and fun but also like what a good way to practice laps on that just on a you know crappy snow condition day get out to the resort or even skin and just mess around with uh, dropping a knee not dropping a knee skating and it's a good way to just figure it all out so you're ready in the backcountry I got to interject. I got to tell Greg, I have, I have split skied a ton of the Catamount trail and I would prefer to do it with, ki with skins on over no skins. Right. Yeah. 
Hey, Danny, do you have uh, anything to add to the resort versus backcountry discussion? Yeah, sure. Um, personally, I really think it depends on what style of riding you're riding on the resort. Um, obviously, there's different varieties of styles. When you snowboard, there's freestyle, there's all mountain, there's wood riding. So I think it really depends on what you're looking for during that day. Um, obviously, if you're park riding, I would not suggest a split board personally. Um, just not super flexy, not super fun. It's pretty stiff like they were talking about. Um, but if you're looking to just like carve around or if it's a powder day, I wouldn't see why it would be an issue. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, anything else to add to the board discussion before we jump into bindings? I will say I have some friends out at Copper Mountain, Colorado, who split board when the lifts aren't spinning to the handrails to ride handrails. So it's it's done. <laughs> if, if, you're done a, but if you're a fun? course, you can make it happen. And it's awesome. Is it fun? I agree with Danny. <laughs> uh, I mean, just the one because thing, it can happen yeah. doesn't mean it's technically it mean it's fun. Uh, the one other thing to talk about with boards is sizing mm -hmm. for backcountry boards. Uh, you know, normally, you know, the go-to for like a park or resort board is like what, like chest to, to chin. You kind of want to size up a little more to about eye level. Um, and that's just for travel. Um, I forget what I recommended is at, at West. I think it's like two to five centimeters above is what mm. they go for, but it, and the it's also that, preference. And the assumption is that's because if you're in the backcountry, you're more you're wider open terrain, hopefully softer terrain. Yeah. And you want that flotation and that support that you're going to get from a bigger board. The thing yeah. that scares me about that, though, is that you get on something out there that you're not normally riding every day, and it's a you know it, it could be a detriment if if you get too sized up. I I've kept everything pretty much you know between a between a few centimeters basically. You know you can jump around here here and there a little bit, but mm. I probably personally I like to keep everything kind of about the same. So, so a little bit of extra length is good, but don't get crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Preference. Greg, I, I've got another question that's related to boards that might help uh, transition into uh, bindings and, and uphill and everything. And sure. we, we all have boards that are primarily a form of camber somewhere in the board as the primary mm -hmm. performance for structure um you know i wish we had like a never summer guy or something here on the call with us get joe jones on on the next round um so i, I like i ride a hybrid rocker a lot on the resort i ride a never summer and i have seen and, and had instances where people have had some sort of rocker between the feet when skinning right behind the binding and it decreases performance of skinning because you don't have that camber zone flattening out while you're going uphill to create contact. Um, Pear, Kyle, do either of you have any stats from the Westin crew that have maybe looked at that and talked about skinning efficiencies with board actual like profile? I'm pretty positive our board, almost all our, I think all our boards are camber. Um, but I believe we've talked about it just amongst friends that any sort of other style, like you said, like contact is key. And having that rocker profile, you're not going to have that flat contact in the middle. I had a I had a Rome white room years ago that I had for literally like a month, and I had that problem. It was like more of a flat camber underfoot, mm. um, and and I rode it during Stella, which, as we all remember, it didn't matter what you were on as long as you were floating that. But uh, skinning up was it was not that much fun. Yeah. You and and the camber kind of gives you the pop too into your next step, yeah. like it kind of steps, right. you know, into your next. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to rely on some comments from some uh, old yeah. school telemark or AT people with double camber skis who know a little bit more about the technical side of that to yeah. let us know. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's let's move on into bindings. So, Danny, what are you, what bindings are you running this year for on your board? 
Um, I am running the Hitchhikers from Burton, um, but they use pretty much the Tesla like technology. So they're very similar to the Teslas. Um, one thing about Burton's Hitchhikers that I'm really happy I waited on, um, they used to use the pin for the, the like toe connector. And now they use the pin free technology, which is Oh my gosh, way better. Cause I tried demoing them and they had the one where you shoved it through and it would get stuck. And when you're transitioning, it was just such a pain. But now the hitchhikers have, they've definitely improved the techno- technology to make the transitions a little bit more seamless. Nice. So the pin, and, and when you refer to the pin, you're referring to like a, a separate piece that slides in and slides out. And so you have, uh, <clears throat> there's a part you could potentially drop in the snow. Um, Usually I had like a wire that connected it to the board so you wouldn't like lose it. Um, But yeah, no. And then the binding overall, um, the, you know, they use the cradle, um, the cradle, why can't, I'm freezing up right now. Um, And I can't talk. Um, But yeah, they use that technology. It's super lightweight. It's, they do the 3D printer um, for the straps. God, couldn't think of a strap. Um, but yeah, so it makes it super lightweight and it molds to your foot and is super comfortable. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, Mitch, what are you running this year? Me and myself here. Uh, I'm on Karakorum Prime SLs from 2018. Um, I was shopping around. I used to have the Vole DIY kit and then upgraded to the, to the light rail, the like it's basically the same kit you still uses the pin um, and that was that was great it serves a, a purpose the the plates are and pins are a great way to get in use an old pair of bindings use bindings you're comfortable with you're used to and put them on a board that's new um, but then shopped around a lot and ended up going with Karakorum for a couple of reasons um, one of them being at the time Karakorum was the only one doing this your high back adjustment you can turn off that high back so when you're going uphill, you're not getting the top of your high back jamming into the back of your calf the whole time. And I noticed that with a lot of my friends on the hitchhikers, though the system with the, the pinless toe I really liked, um, I, I ended up going with this. There's that piece. Um, I forget what this is called. Um, one of you Weston guys might know, but there's this additional piece that connects to your ankle strap to the high back and you can flip this lever and it tightens it up and it creates some torsional stiffness when you're yeah. side hilling. As someone who tele skis Alpine tours, anytime I get on my split board and I need it to side hill and follow a skin track that is also the downhill where it gets skied off or ridden off and it's just this, you can't get any grip. Your edges really don't do much. Your skins don't do much. You really have to kind of get technical in there. It really does a lot of work on, a, on the longer days like on the Catamount Trail between the Bryant camp in Nebraska notch on the Bolton trap trail. Like there's a lot of times where you're just on that same double fall line the whole time and it gets old fast. And this creates a little bit of that stiffness, which is nice. And then the last piece that I really liked is that Karakorum's active joining technology, which is you can see those pins in the back sliding out. So that connects on the base plate and really sucks the board together, uh, which works really well for me. Quick transitions, really easy, holds everything together. And I also use Karakorum for my resort board. I use the connect system, which uses the same base plate. So you can take one binding, swap it from board to board. So whenever I'm traveling, yeah. which I do a lot with, uh, with one of my industry roles, it's just nice to be able to bring split board, resort board, powder board, and just bring my split board bindings to not haul a bunch of things, especially like flying on a plane. You can stack boards, throw just yeah. one pair of bindings in there, and then just whatever conditions, whatever you're doing for the day throw that binding on there so a lot of convenience for me the uh the strap system you have i think it was called flex lock flex lock that's it yep and there's a lot of new technology that they've come out with that i don't even have on my board uh with my bindings like the i have the original ride mode uh the new one is like a composite um that has a specific design that ejects snow as it slides together so you don't have to worry about fussing with ice build up and slush and anything like that you just connect the board slide it and the, the way they chamfer the draft angles in the molds just pops all the snow out and it connects really tightly and makes it really easy to get the bindings on so that'll be my next upgrade <laughs> nice 
Kyle, what are what are you sporting this year? Oh, I'm such a bad example. I haven't updated my bindings in probably four years. Um, I have the Vole speed rails, so they're the step up from the light rails. Uh, the light rails are the ones with the pins, and they swapped them out. I'll pull one off for you. Um, they swapped them out for hooks. If you can see those hooks. So those hooks will go into your touring bracket. Um, they do fit onto the spark pucks, so they are the same uh, ride mode. Um, but otherwise, they do the trick. They're not the flashiest. They're not the greatest. They have pretty decent reviews. I'm not a picky rider, so until these break, these are kind of my my go to. Uh, they did. I did lose a high back, and luckily enough, I found an extra and fixed it. Nice. <clears throat> And pair, what are you what are you riding this year for bindings? Uh, Spark R and D is uh, I've been on Sparks since since 2011. I uh, was on their burners with the pins. Uh, this is the Surge. It's probably two years old, 2018, 2019. Um, same same um, concept as the Burton Hitchhikers, I believe. With the I can't remember the name for that, uh, but it's a pinless system. Uh, and it is super slick, just slide it onto the board. And then Mitch was saying about um, about the Karakorum's spark went a little bit further and you have a high back lever here and you can flip it the whole way up. And then the high back actually goes back over center a couple degrees. Um, so when you're, uh, when you're striding it out in the skin track, you really, it, it, it's so beneficial to be able to not have that, um, not have that high back jamming up in the back of your ankle. Uh, the other thing I love about these guys are the straps, I, the spark R and D proprietary. I can't remember the name of the straps, but a uh, pillow line strap, something like that. They are. Yeah, you're right. Cool. Absolutely, is that what it is, Kyle? Yeah. The, they're absolutely the most comfortable straps, uh, that I've ever used. I, my feet are always going to sleep. I'm always cranking down on the, my bindings as, uh, as hard as I can so that I've got, you know, complete control over the, over the board. And, and these guys just make it, make it really comfortable. Nice. <clears throat> so for somebody that's getting into split boarding, <clears throat> these bindings are all great, but like, what do you need? Like, so you need to buy a board, you need to buy some bindings. Is there other stuff you need to make the bindings work with a board? Like, what does that system look like? <clears throat> what are some considerations somebody will need to make if they're kind of like looking to put together a package? Well, you've also got to have, you have to have <clears throat> mounting hardware too, Greg. Um, yeah. And and the basic, what I, I've been running forever is just the standard valet pucks. Pick them up for like 60 bucks. Uh, they're plastic. I've never had an issue. I, I split board over a hundred days every year. And I am, I do not take care of my stuff. And I've, I've had zero <laughs> issues with this. Um, and then you've got the, uh, you've got your touring brackets. So that's just this little guy right here. And this is basically um, like a, a pad, you know, yeah. so then it just slips right into there. And then that's all you need. Oh wait, can someone show if you're on steeper terrain since you have your bindings right there, the feature of having the incline like Yeah, you your, have... your heel riser. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah your riser. So Just so people can see that. So I don't know if you can see or not, but there's a little lever right here. Right there. And when you're skinning on steeper terrain, you just pop that lever down. And you've got two choices. Uh, you've got kind of like a, um, a mid angle and then what we always call our high heels when you crank them up like that. So, <laughs> so you can be walking Rocking those stilettos. <laughs> it's, it's the greatest thing ever. It really is. So it, 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 you know, it takes that much. Now you're only going from here instead of having to drop the whole way from here. It just, Here, your bindings have the, uh, your bindings have the whammy bar on it, right? They do. Yes, yeah, so you can yeah. grab it with a basket with your ski poles and your basket, and uh, make sure you file file down those uh, ski poles. I guess they're pretty sharp. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you need so you need a board, you need your bindings, and you need your mounting hardware. 
and are there different types of mounting hardware out there that people would be considering? And so, uh, yeah. and that's one one like uh, reason to buy new. Also, is that if you buy a new binding, almost every manufacturer delivers your mounting hardware and all of those pieces with the kit. So it's something to be aware of if you are buying buying secondhand. A lot of people will sell just the split board without the hardware or just a split board with the pucks or the connecting hardware and not the binding. So be mindful if you buy a board that has a vole puck system on it and you really want Karakorum or spark bindings, I, make sure the, the model of bindings matches up with the pucks or the mounting hardware that you have. And you can upgrade a lot of them. You can buy individual components from the manufacturers mm -hmm. and you can also change out for um, different parts of that hardware. Like there's different types of joining clips here. You know, this is yeah. one that has a little hinging piece. Some boards, they're just the yin yang clips or they just hook together the yep. tip clips. This one's a pretty basic Karakorum one that just snaps on. Spark makes an awesome one that has a little like movement lever on it that, or there's like multiple points that create an even more firm joint. So lots of customization, but definitely something to be mindful of. Cool. Yeah, there's there's multiple. So Spark Spark and Vole will fit the same puck system. So if you have Vole bindings, they'll fit on Spark pucks or Vole pucks and vice versa. Union is another company we didn't talk about. Uh, they have their own system, which I believe is sort of like a weird circular lock-in system. Similar-ish to Karakorum, just not as well manufactured because Karakorum is built by a, a rocket scientist. Um, and then there's... Uh, what I mentioned. So Spark, Karakorum, Union. Oh, there's Phantom. So Phantom is a hard boot set setup. So similar to skiing. I don't have any experience with it other than knowing that it's hard boot and it should lock in similar to skis, but that's about my knowledge of it. A lot of them use the like free pivot pins like Alpine Touring, uh, where the hard boot has integrated inserts that allows you to to frictionless yeah. Tour. There's, you have a pin to another... like a, a Dina Fit style toe piece that you're clipping. Exactly. Yeah, it's like that's mounted to the board, and then you take the boot off, and then there's a different system that allows it to to lock into the actual board and connect it. I'm not a hard boot split boarder. I I don't know the ins and outs of that, but I I have seen it, and it's some pretty cool technology. Yeah. Well, maybe we don't need to delve into all the compatibility issues tonight, but maybe splitboardvt.com yeah. could uh, maybe that's a, a future article that we could yeah. we could go up on the site. Yeah. Um, I did have, you mentioned the clips on your board and there's a question in the chat about active or passive clips. Is it, you guys have a preference for one or the other or pros and cons? Um, active for sure. Assume active is like the locking setup, right? I, would, I, would, I would agree with, yeah. I would agree with pair and say active cause you can tighten it. You can lock it however you want and make sure that space between your, your split is as tight as possible. Resonance and natural frequency is a real thing. So when you're in the backcountry, especially on hard pack, your board's going to vibrate and somewhere it's going <laughs> to find that, that perfect chatter that's going to rattle some sort of component loose. And uh, the active aspect, whether it's the tip and tail clips or the joining clips or the actual binding mounting system itself, I feel like if there's something that can't come loose, you're just setting yourself up to not have watch your tips do this in the powder as <laughs> onto the chambery, uh, fire road. <laughs> that being said, always bring some sort of tool with you, a multi-tool yeah, or something like that. Yeah, and extra hardware. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ski straps too. I've given out so many screws. <laughs> so one more, uh, one more binding related question that came up in the chat. Um, uh, softer, softer, stiff back, high backs. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So any preference? You guys preference. Have preferences? I think it's preference. Yeah. Preference. yeah. Style, boot style, con conditions. I ride a really soft binding on the resort and my split board bindings are really stiff. And when I cross match, I have to like reset how I ride, but I really like the stiffness and the responsiveness for skinning, side hilling, going faster and but it's yeah it's totally preference. I, I personally find that your boot binding combo matters more than the binding stiffness itself like you got to make sure that if you like lateral stiffness if you like fore half stiffness or ankle flexion like you got to find the right combo that fits with your riding style agreed and so for general so do you guys have a preference for riding in the backcountry i mean understandably like if you're at the resort there's a variety of different like ways you can approach the terrain 
Um, but in the backcountry, it tends to be, I mean, there are a variety of ways you can approach backcountry train as well. Um, but at the same time, it seems like, um, do you guys have a preference for like a stiffer setup or a softer setup for backcountry riding? I'd say a stiffer setup personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Danny, you? Yeah, I'd agree a little bit stiffer just because of the style of riding you're doing out there. Um, I want my board to, you know, be very responsive and the, when it's a little bit stiffer, it's a little bit more responsive. Nice. <clears throat> awesome. Guys, anything else you guys want to add about bindings? Oh, yes, I do. I have a rant. Greg. <laughs> split board binding or split board binding crampons. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. 75, 100 bucks. Go buy yourself a set because it will I save you the, the sliding backwards on, on an icy skin track is the worst feeling in the world, especially I've never, never skied before. So like not, yeah. <laughs> especially on that straight edge when you have no turn yeah. radius whatsoever to actually flex and function as it yeah. at, with tally and Alpine touring, I like never need crampons split boarding. Like most of the lines in Vermont, someone has ridden down the skin track and yeah. you're just looking like a baby giraffe walking for the first time. <laughs> I go to Pico a lot. I tour at Pico a lot in the evenings and boy, it's nice touring up. You're touring on great corn snow. Oh, this is going to be awesome. And then the sun goes down and it turns to blue ice and you've almost made it, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went to the Burton sale one year and they were selling them for $10. Just say. Wow. Oh, good to know. Like there. Yeah. You hear yeah. that everyone? <laughs> Greg, I have one more thing binding related, and that this is something I feel like you would only maybe know if you are like me and you do the other disciplines as well. But the split board binding is one of the only boot binding combos that the bottom of your foot stays stiff the entire day while touring. Telly, you're flexing at the bellow, at the ball of the foot, alpine touring, you can really like open up that ankle, get a little bit more flexion, a little bit more natural movement. And if you're spending a full day in the backcountry, the bottom of your foot is just in a cast all day. So yeah. something that I've done a lot of is I like when we're on flat, chill, single fall line terrain, I'll loosen up that ankle strap, even though it's not nearly as efficient, just let that, let my foot naturally flex. Perfect. Otherwise you get cramps you, you you get like plantar fasciitis you get you name it it'll, <laughs> it'll happen to you and uh it's yeah something on those longer days is uh it'll make your ride out not fun if you're not mindful of that nice so you keep the toe strap tight keep that boot locked in there and just yeah snug i wouldn't say tight i would say tight. snug like you want it snug. enough that it's not moving but it, there's no reason to crank it down and restrict blood flow um but similar concept to any any discipline is you want kind of want the toe to the heel pocket to stay pretty like locked in. So you're not moving around slosh and getting blisters, but you want that ankle to have as much range of motion as possible. But every foot is different. Every ankle is different. Every boot binding board combo is different. Um, so it's definitely something to listen to your body while you're touring, listen to your equipment and, <laughs> and make tweaks and, and go look up other people or go talk to other split boarders and hear what they're doing. If you're, feeling some weird pains or things that feel like they're major inefficiencies with your touring or riding. Well, that seems like a perfect segue into boots. Oh, sorry, Danny. It's like clip your toenails before your slip <laughs> Yes. 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 <laughs> I have you made that mistake. <laughs> well, I was going to say that makes a perfect, it seems like a perfect segue into boots. You know, we're talking yeah. about ankle mobility and uh, whatnot. So uh, let's go around and see what you guys are riding for boots. Uh, Danny, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so split boarding, I feel like I just ride what I have. Um, I mean, honestly, I was riding a little bit stiffer boots and my dog ate the boa on them. So it pushed me to my backup boots, which are a little packed out, which isn't great, but I do need new boots this year. But right now I'm just riding the rituals. Um, they're pretty soft. They were my park riding boots. I probably should ride different boots, um, but when I'm going up, I usually loosen my boots. And then before I go down, I usually tighten my boots. Um, and that's again with the blood flow and just making sure that they're not too tight in your feet. I have really bad circulation. So I definitely want to make sure my circulation is going on the way up. So do you prefer, it sounds like your, your primary boots were a BOA system. 
And are yes, your backup boots are your backup boots a lace or are they a boa system as well? Um, they're actually I actually have them here. They're like the pole ones. Okay. The pole off ones. Yep. Um, but I like the boas especially for split boarding because you don't want your hands out too much, and I feel like laces would just be a no go for me. So you want something that's quick, easy to like adjust, and boas are pretty nice for that. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. I, have a pet, I have a pet peeve with that, if I can jump in. Um, <laughs> so I love BOA. I think it's such a great system. Um, I ride Burn SLX, which is Speed Zone. Uh, one, okay. I'm a huge fan of zone lacing, whatever the lacing is. Have something different for the foot as you have for your ankle when it comes to touring, because you're going to be needing to adjust both of those differently. But BOA, there's there's a lot of conversation around malfunction in the backcountry where, like, Boa, I've had this happen myself, not in the backcountry, fortunately, but I've had the metal, the little metal boa cabling break while riding and you're kind of screwed. Like there's no way to tighten that up, at least with the speed zone. If the, if the cable or rope snaps, you can just wrap it around your hand, pull it tight, lock it in or tie a knot somewhere and you're good to go. Uh, that being said, a lot of brands have started moving to like Burton's one of them. They moved to their like New England lace system, I think is what they call it, New England. And it's not the little metal cabling. It's this synthetic I don't know, nylon, really strong roping that when it comes out, you can pull it out of the boa, tighten it up and tie it off into a little knot. So something that's like a, a cool plug and a cool shift in the industry is understanding that in the backcountry you things go wrong yeah, like it, yeah. and having yeah. that kind of repairability in the field repairability is kind of a nice exactly feature. but also, zone, also, the zone feature is awesome and the zone boa is awesome especially like Volcom makes an awesome pair of Gore-Tex pants that have like both of your boa zones are within your powder skirt that you can like pop them out so you know you yeah. have to pull your snow pants up you just like ride the bottom up and you can like tighten the zone with your big mittens on like it's like great product design uh but when you bring them all together i don't know i haven't done the research but i imagine if all of those aspects are together you've got the perfect lacing system and the perfect boot <laughs> also sounds like you need to carry some bow straps yeah. yes yes yes, yes. Hmm. all right so let's see uh mitch do you want to what, what are, do you have anything else to add about your boots do you want to talk about your specific boots um, my boots, I went for fit more than function. I, I really needed two, two things were my desire for function. And that was a, a good, like grippy sole. Uh, didn't matter what the brand was. I just wanted some sort of rubber that will hold up and will stick to rocks on the yeah. spring days and early season and, um, and the zone lacing system. But for me, I actually have a lot of foot and ankle issues, major injuries, surgeries, different things in, in my past. So I, I need a, a wide toe box and a tight heel, uh, kind of like that. I need my toes to be able to splay. As soon as they get cramped together, I lose circulation. I get metatarsal issues, plantar fasciitis. And I found the burn SLX naturally is a tight heel, wide toe box. And they have, I think burn calls it foot print reduction technology, um, but it basically just shrinks the toe to heel difference and allows it to taper up. And for me, that's awesome. I, I wear a size 11, which is not demanding of a wide board, but I ride wide boards because I, I get really high edge angles and do a lot of carving when I'm back on the resort, when I'm like coming out of Bowen Valley or something and having a stubbier boot that still has everything I need gives me more effective edge angle. And uh, that's, that was huge for me. Nice. <clears throat> Kyle, what are you, what are you riding this year? Uh, I have the Deluxe Summits, which are like the step up above the Deluxe Sparks, I believe are the other ones. They're Vibram Souls. So same with Mitch, like a grippy soul for those spring days. Like if you're, you know, I know this is CTA, but if you're going to Tuckerman Ravine or anything like that in the spring and you're hiking up, they're really great for that. Um, along with the Fastly system that Danny and Mitch were talking about, like I also have it's like two lace systems on either side and also a heel support boa. So I can tighten and loosen that depending on how I'm feeling. If my foot is, you know, asleep or just need to get more comfort or need it to be tighter for, for touring. Um, they are on the poshier side, but I'd rather my feet be comfortable and, and healthy so that I can still tour and ride down. And when you say foot support boa, what does, what do you, what does that do? It's not, it's like, um, so it's a cable system that'll go across the top of your foot and just tighten your, your heel so that your foot, your, basically your heel doesn't lift out of the sole at all while you're touring. 
Nice. So drag, it kind of sucks your heel in a little bit mm -hmm. without separate from like your, your lower foot and uh, lower leg lacing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then on top of that, there's a, um, a Velcro strap for your, for your ankle and your calf. So you can loosen that. I think most touring boots probably have that. Sweet. <clears throat> awesome. And Para, what are you, what are you sporting? Uh, I'm on TM2, uh, the 32 TM2 XLTs. Um, like everybody else, got Vibram soles on them. Um, they got uh, a little, I wouldn't call it a crampon welt, but there's definitely uh, <laughs> something there for a crampon. Um, so that makes it, you know, like Kyle was saying, when we go across to Connecticut and go, go, up, go up George, there's, uh, there's, there's a little bit of extra there. Um, it has, it's just traditional laces. Um, I'm kind of, I'm of the opinion, I, I do have another pair of uh, boots, uh, the T-Rice Pros from a couple years ago that have the dual BOA system. I just, I, I've had a lot of things go wrong in the back country, you know, just gear wise, stuff breaks, it gets cold. Um, this, I just, I carry an extra uh, bit of paracord with me and I could make up another pair of laces, no problem. They have intuition liners, which are custom moldable. And I really think that's why I get away with a lot. Um, they're, those intuition liners are awesome. They keep your feet warm um, and they're, they're just perfectly molded uh, to my feet. I use custom uh, footbeds from Boot Dock too with those guys, which, uh, which helped me edge to edge, honestly, the, the custom, custom insoles. Awesome. So any, what, any other considerations? It seems like we've covered a lot with the boots, but is, like when you guys look for boots, is there, are there any, Major, major differences when you're considering like a boot for inbounds use versus uh, resort use? I like a, I mean, I like a stiffer boot yep. for yep. all my riding. So that's kind of what I was looking for. And, uh, and, and for splitting, definitely, it seems like everybody across the board is, is trending more towards a stiffer boot. And that's, that's what the, that's what the TM2 XLTs are. Sweet. The boot in the uh, the heel cup in your bindings, that's also something to be mindful of. I've seen a lot of this, you know, where where your boot sits in the metal cup. Yeah. Different brands are, are more or less compatible. They all work with everything, but I've seen a lot of like a freestyle, softer, lower entry price point boot. That's a great boot for riding resort and regular <laughs> binding. When you're touring and your heel is doing this all day on the metal, it just, it acts like sandpaper and it just grinds away that foam or that rubber. So uh, it's, a lot of the touring boots have, have been over the past three, four years have been designed with the, the, the sole, the rubber on the sole kind of curling up over the heel part way up where the kind of the Achilles uh, part of your, your boot is so that that rubbing doesn't really happen as bad. And like Mitch was like Mitch was saying, I think, you know, lower whatever you got to do to get out there, you know, but once you're trying to refine, refine things, you're probably looking at that top tier boot as opposed to the, you know, the 150 model, $150 model. You're really going to find yourself, unfortunately, I hate to say this number out loud, like the $400 model, you know, the pro model, yeah. you'll get more, you'll get more days out of them too, though. So that's a great point. Yeah, you can do it with anything, but as you start to refine, price point is going to go up because you're adding more technology, better manufacturing, more intentional design, and also that you want it to last, and you're putting it through quite a bit more abuse when you're going up and down, and there's a lot of movement. Good tips. All right, let's question move on. Guys. Wait, I have oh. a quick question for everyone. So new boots, how do you guys, what do you guys get do to get your new boots like, ready for backcountry? Do you like wear them right out the door? Right out the door. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Right out of the door at dark side. I drive home with them. So, you know, and yeah. <laughs> I found a really great, so I get blisters no matter what. I'm, I mean, I wore the same boots for three seasons. My first, my first tour, I will get blisters. I like during the season, yeah. I wear a, a, a small sock, but I, I like, I have so many sports and my feet just like get used to them. Like right now my feet are so used to my ride concepts, mountain bike flats. And then uh, by the time I start riding, uh, snowboarding, it's like, it's going to wear, it's going to get used to that. And then I'm going to start tallying more and same thing. So I found, um, I used to just 
pad myself on that first tour and it, it has worked. I just used like regular moleskin or, or just regular band-aids or something like that. Lots of different hacks that people use. Some people say use two pairs of socks. So one sock is riding on the other sock. Uh, for me, there's, I don't know what it's called, but it's like every drugstore carries it. It's this little plastic clamshell package that has these little blister pads that just you stick onto the zones that cause blisters. And I know exactly where those spots are. And for the first like three or four tours, I throw them on, I throw my regular socks on, I go and just make sure I'm going for a short skin. It's like not going for more than, you know, maybe 45 minutes up and then back down and, and let everything wear. That's my issue. That's how I break in new boots, either each season or brand new boots is like pad the, pad the zones I know about and just, get my skin raw. <laughs> right. Well, the, the pads, the blister pads are the compede ones, I, I believe. Yeah, then, that sounds right. Yeah. Band-Aid makes them. Those are, those are really good to have in your repair kit. Cause like nothing, mm. ruins, nothing ruins a tour or ruins a, a group's day rather than like somebody with a blister. I've gone through most of those by lending them to the friends I tour with. They're like, they're like excited to go out. We get going out and 10 minutes in, they're like, my foot's really hot. And I'm like, all right, strip your boot now. Let's try it <laughs> off and get one of those pads on there. And it saves the tour. Totally. I mean, I, as a, I, I've run into, I've had blister problems in the past. I started wearing uh, a liner sock, a specific, mm. like yeah. super thin uh, yeah. polyester liner sock. And that, that over like, as long as your socks are sized properly, like that thing, that's totally gotten rid of any blister issues I've had. So that's been, awesome. uh, I got through 20,000 feet last year without a problem. Yeah. So, nice. Um, there's how, like, that's, that's, I've got another question about boots. Like, what, is there a difference between how you size the boot for backcountry, uh, for splitboarding versus the resort? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Kind of All right. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. all right so let's move on the next piece the next kind of critical piece of gear is going to are going to be skins yeah um, and this is going to be something that you know fewer riders are going to be familiar with so um kyle what are you what are you running for skins this year uh i have the volets i forget the name of them the orange ones because there's also like the high traction green ones i forgot what they're called but i've had them for i think since my first split in 2015 and as long as you take care of them I haven't had to re-glue them yet. I'll see what they're like this season. But, I mean, the biggest tip I have is take care of your skins. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, well, how about how about I put this question out to everybody? Um, you know, skiers, skiers, there's definitely a little bit more emphasis on, like, getting some glide out of your stride when you're, when you're skinning. Um, <clears throat> with splitboard setup, is that as much of a concern? And do you guys kind of, are you guys considering like, are you getting nylon skins or mohair skins or, you know, hybrid skins, or are you just like, whatever you can get, put them on, take traction. Yeah. Yeah. Traction's key. Traction is number one. Traction's yeah. number one. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds, yeah. It sounds like earlier, like traction is definitely a little bit harder to get with, uh, yeah. in a, out of a splitboard setup. So yeah. you're going to, you guys are prioritizing traction, number one but everybody feel everybody feel like that's kind of your priority when picking skins yeah All right. yeah well, price point i would say for most yeah. people because <laughs> splitboard skins are i mean it's they're not as long but they're wider and for some reason that they tend to be priced more i mean a, a brand new set of g3 ascension skins on for skis are you know 140 to 150 bucks for boarding their 210 220 wow. same skin um but the tail clips tip clips are just they're more complex you've got to find that angle so yeah secondhand skins seem to really rule our world with yeah. or, or discounted yeah we have more odd shaped boards that we yeah. have to deal with so our, yeah. our clips can be very different Swallowtails, I know we were, yeah. we had this huge round table last season what, with the Japal. Weston makes uh, a yeah. Japal swallowtail that is super sick. Um, but the to be able to capture that swallowtail was, yeah. um, it, it took, it took some, some really interesting <laughs> ingenuity. Yeah. yeah. So does anybody want to, can we step pause for a minute? Does anybody want to go through what a skin is? really quickly for sure. people that are just like don't don't sure. have an idea i've got one right in front of me so we can look at that so the skin 
I'm not gonna open it all up because it won't be visible. On one side, you've got fibers that all face one direction, kind of like this. And as you slide this way, the fibers lay down flat. As you go backwards, they stick in. I like to use the analogy of if you ever watch like a penguin or a seal come sliding up under an iceberg and then they don't slide backwards. They're naturally built like that so that their fur doesn't, doesn't function that way. Yeah. Uh, on, on the other side is this tacky glue uh, that's designed to stick on, be reused over and over again. And the skin slides on the tip to the tail so you can shuffle up the mountain. And, um, and then on the, on the tail, there's this resizable stretchy clip that allows you to keep some tension to keep the snow out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone want to add to that? No, that's pretty big. Uh, just they're direct, as Mitch said, just remember they're directional. You put them on the wrong way and you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> I did that. You always time. I did too. <laughs> we yeah. always get one at split fest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, they, and I imagine since the, since the skis aren't symmetrical, there are there's a right and a left as well. Yeah. So you gotta make sure you get them on. And I've been split boarding for a decade and I still draw this on every one of my skins. I don't know if you can see it with the lighting. I've got oh, yep. you know that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. enough to say this is the flat side, that's the round oh. side. Because I'll just especially in the backcountry when you're you're in flow state and your brain isn't intellectually like ticking. You're just like, go, go, go. And your, your body's feeling it. You don't want to slow that down and then try to do math on what skin goes on what side. Mitch, um, I actually, I put a Grateful Dead steal your face on all my, all my <laughs> tips of my split boards when I first started. Cause you, how many times you put that together backwards right, and, right. and the rest of your friends are like, well, yeah, <laughs> you're really taking apart, we're putting it together. Also, uh, trimming is another thing. Sorry, Dan, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, so when you're putting your split board down on the ground too, you want to actually go the opposite direction for going up. I don't think we mentioned that with the board. We didn't. No. Um, which is kind of important. <laughs> um, yeah, you've got the you got this hardware sticking out, and if you're sliding up the hill like this, you're catching the hardware. You're catching your bindings. So once you put it down, reverse it so you've got these nice smooth sides that you're not going to. Plus yeah. all your expensive equipment. Agreed. I think my favorite, uh, my favorite skin tip is when you're out there and you're doing multiple laps, put them in your jacket in between laps. Uh, you put them in your backpack and make a run and you're super stoked and you get down to the bottom and your glue's not sticky anymore. Yep. And now you get the skin up the hill uh, without sticky glue, which sucks. So, <laughs> yeah. Get still packed in. This is my um, this is my lifesaver for split boarding. It's an MSR camping like pots and pans cleaner, a little scrubber brush, a little Ooh. scraper on it. And I saw I forget where it was. Someone I don't know if it was like Cody Townsend or someone like pulled this out and was like, "This is like key." And I got one of these. They're like four bucks at OGE. They're super easy to find. You take your bottom of your board, scrape all the snow off, use the brush to get all the anything out of your bindings. Same thing, if you get snow on your skins, you just slide it down and it just takes all the snow out of your skins. It's like the best, best little like piece of equipment I carry on me. Awesome tip. If you get snow on your skins and you don't have Mitch's fancy brush, I always recommend, <laughs> yep, exactly. Put it up against your leg and, yeah. and start. Yeah. Yeah. Put it right behind your butt and just like yeah, shimmy behind your butt. It takes all the a snow tree, off. tree, your buddy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've seen people scrape the edge of their board as well with yeah. their skin yeah. and pull the snow off. Same as skis. Yeah. There's tons of solutions. Totally. So there's a couple questions coming up in the, in the chat. Uh, what about skin savers? Do you guys, uh, what, what is there, is there, do you take them with you? Oh, yeah. And this, just so everybody knows, a skin saver is uh, this kind of mesh material that goes in between your skins. Uh, what do you guys? What, what are your feelings on those? I put them. Uh, I I put them on if I'm not going at you know like so. It's been a slow start to the season. So if I were going every day, I'd just hang my skins over my shower and then slap yep. them on tomorrow. But uh, since there's a couple days in between riding, I'll throw these back on because. Then it just it's not as big of a pain in the butt to get them back apart. Yeah. So, so a necessary storage solution. You put them on when you're storing them for an extended period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave them yeah. at home. Leave them at home. Yeah. Yeah. Use them at home, but leave them at home. Leave them at hang home. Them, hang them at car. the end of the day. Hang yeah. them at the end yeah. of the day too. Like let them dry <laughs> off. Shower. Whatever. 
wherever you have space to hang it off of a wall or, or a shower rod or whatever you have. Yeah. And, so, and hang them. Uh, so you don't get them stick, hang them. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Carpet side down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a hard time. I've so done that. The, so at the end of the day, dry them out. Yeah. Uh, sticky side up. So, yep. and then I've heard... what about, what about long-term storage? Do you guys, what do you guys do long-term wise? Uh, anything special with your skins? I've heard a bunch of people talking about putting them in the freezer or the refrigerator, but I've, I had a pair of Valet skins last like seven or eight seasons um, by just, you know, putting them back glue to glue and throwing them in the closet all summer and then remembering about them yeah. in November. Yeah. I kept the bag that it came in. I just store it in that. Yep. Extreme temperature and humidity is not good for any of yep. our gear, uh, yep. but for skins, probably primarily. So if you can store them in somewhat climate controlled, probably not yep. store them in a hundred degree hot garage attic or something like that. But <laughs> I know there's, there's actual like tips to that, you know, keeping them yeah. within a specific range of temperature and humidity and everything like that. But my, mine is, I use skin savers off season just to keep all the glue from not grabbing mostly because a lot of my skins are d3 and they have that really like really bad like glue buggering i don't know what you would call that but um yeah uh, with skin savers folded up or rolled up in a bag and then stored somewhere where the temperatures are pretty consistent nice Great. yeah so skin savers throw them in a bag keep them in your basement yep. you should be good to go for many seasons <clears throat> yeah. anybody uh should we anybody want to expound on like nylon versus mixed versus mohair skins. I mean, it sounds like everybody here is just like traction, traction, traction. Is I've had some personal yeah. experience, like some frustrating things. I feel like I'm hogging some of the conversation, but um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ramble here. I'm on uh, the G3 Ascension skins now because I got them for a really great price point. And I had the Burton G3 high traction collab skins before this. They just didn't fit on this board. And it's a world of difference <laughs> or traction going up. Like I miss those high traction skins. It, the Ascension skins are, they're, they glide way better, but I don't know, we're, we're split boarding in Vermont. We're glorified snowshoeing. Uh, we're using, we're using, you know, it's not a lot of kicking gliding where you're covering long terrain on a split board. I, I'd love these skins on some of my uh, ski equipment, but um, I found that the G3 high traction has been my favorite that I've tried. I haven't tried all of them and I've tried uh, Big Sky, which is a newer skin company out of Montana. And their most of their skins are high traction and their split board skins are awesome, but they're more involved when it comes to setting it up. Like you buy G3, Black Diamond, Pomoco, yeah. um, Contour, any, any of those, they come with a tip and tail clips. You're ready to go. You take them out of the box, throw them on your board. You just use the easy skin cutting tool and you just run it down the edge of, of your ski and you're good to go. Um, with a, with uh, the big sky, it kind of just comes as a blank skin and then it comes with all the hardware. So you have to flip the, the tip and cut it and some of them come with rivets and things like that. So a little bit more complex, but the price point's lower and the grip is amazing. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> so it sounds like what I'm hearing from all you guys is like traction's king price is king because they're 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 just more expensive than like a, a typical ski skin and like the benefits of like a mohair or a mohair mixed skin like just addition, addition, better handling packability glide like those they really don't come into play much at all we yeah. go up to go down sorry we go up to turn around and go down there's not a whole lot of <laughs> split boarding so yeah. just good, good to know <laughs> I, I just want to make sure people listening or people tuning in yeah. like they know where to yeah. focus their energy and like, yeah the no, I the mohair and like the the combos like the mohair nylon mixes they're gonna have a better glide as far as i know um i have nylons those orange volets that you see a lot of people have their nylons well, it sounds like you guys, it sounds like tractions can be an issue. And so anything that produces track gives you a better, more traction is kind of like what you guys, you know, it makes your, it, it improves your experience. And so traction improves your experience more than glide does. So it sounds like that's where people should be focusing. Yeah. Um, so that's good. It's, that's good. Cause there's a lot of skins out there and there's a lot those higher end skins, you know, people might be drawn to them because they're, they're more expensive, right? So they must be better. And so it's, it's just so good to you know. None of nobody here really feels that 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 pressure to go with a higher end skin or a more expensive skin. So awesome! Just get yourself some.
Get yourself some skin wax in in the spring though, because you're gonna want that. Yeah. 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 So skin. How about so skin wax and and any trimming tips? I feel like I feel like trimming skins is one of those things that new people new to the sport kind of really puts them off, and it's it's kind of a scary. It can be a little bit of a scary thing for them. Take um, your time. Take watch off, a whole yeah. bunch of YouTube videos. And only Just take really off a little bit at a time. Yep. And. Yeah. A little bit of time and you want to be able to see that edge i like to see a little bit of base and and that that way i know i i have edge on both of my both of my sides there i'm with pear i usually have like just a tiny little bit of base where my skin is and have you have any of you guys used like the g3 trim tool just the what... just the belay letter opener yeah. that comes with it yeah, yeah. So, that's so what here, i have so here so here's a tip for oh yeah, there you go. So I, I've used the G3. I've used the the Black Diamond one. That was basically like a box opener. Uh, a yep. big guy sends you with like literally a box opener. It's like a, a cheap like actual knife blade. And then one of my friends got Pomoco skins and I trimmed them and I just kept his tool because this tool is amazing. Um, it's, like, it, it's offset. It gives you like a great grip and it just, it glides so smooth. So if anyone knows someone who got Fumoko skins, who's not cutting it and you have to cut skins <laughs> I like to a beer or something, because it well, makes it so easy. Well, and I'll just throw this out there. Like if you guys have never used, if you guys have just used like the box cutter style cutter, uh, G3 makes a trim tool. You can pick it up at most shops that sell skins separately for like five bucks. And it's not quite as big and it doesn't have, offer as much purchase as like the Pomoco one does. But yeah, you just put your skin on, get it centered, and then you just drag that down and it leaves like the perfect amount of edge. Um, oh, wow. You know, They're great. It's one of those things it takes like, it makes trimming skins like from this like kind of arduous, like I don't want to, I'm scared I'm going to mess it up to just like, you put it on, you just drag that tool down a couple of times and you're done. And like, you could you can trim a pair of skins in like five minutes and, mm -hmm. and they're perfect. That's cool. So... Definitely look into the G3 trim, trim tools, like super cheap and works really well. And then, yeah, that Pomoco one, I've got one of those as well. And that thing is sick. And so. the G3 ones come with every skin you buy too. You don't have to purchase it extra. So I guess another another good marketing. Yeah. Same with, I think same with Volets. They give you a, the little like business card one. Yeah, but you should, you should throw that in the trash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, it's exactly it's where like that belongs. belongs. <laughs> yep. I think I lost both of mine at this point because I just don't care about them. Cool. All right, let's see. Any glop stopper? You guys, anybody, what, let's, tell, let's tell people oh, yeah. about what is, what is glop stopper or skin wax? I, in the spring, it's inevitable that you're going to skin on some sort of mashed potatoes along the way. <laughs> and and once you establish six inches of wet, heavy snow that you got to drag with you up any amount, you're going to be like, what was that stuff called again? <laughs> you just, all you have to do is one, I just put one coat on, uh, really, I start in the spring when stuff starts to turn there and uh, put one coat on, I don't know, every few tours or something. And if I'm out there and it starts to glob up, I'll add a little bit more, but uh I, I think I went with, is it Black Diamond that makes the glob stopper? Yeah, the glob stopper, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, it's basically just a, I mean, if, for people that don't know, it's just a bar, it's basically a bar of wax. Yep, and, yep. To, and to apply it, you just rub it on. Um, yep. There's no special. Rub it, not back and forth, only with yeah. the hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah it clarified that we rub it on the skins and not the board. The skin <laughs> and not yeah. the glue. <laughs> Yeah, um, don't do it I'm on the board. The the board. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So yeah, and what that does is like in the spring, like you're saying, like there's a higher water content in the snow. And then yeah. you also have shade, sun and shade snow. So when you're moving from this that like wet, sunny snow into the cooler, drier, cold snow, that's when you get that freezing. And you break it really causes like yeah, you like you're saying, yeah. you, you'll notice right away. There'll be you'll ha you'll end up with these like snow stilts on your on your skin. Yeah. So um so yeah but you, you, it's good traction <laughs> and it's a good day wrecker too man i'll tell you that's oh like how long do i want to drag this up the hill yeah so like a little like six dollar block of wax is like a yep. perfect thing throw it in your pack just it's easy to have with you all the time um awesome all right let's see skins all right now poles when we last week when we were doing skiing poles wasn't a really a big discussion point uh, but I feel like for snowboarders, it's going to be, this maybe warrants a little bit more of a discussion because snowboarders usually don't carry poles. 
And the poles that you guys are choosing are going to definitely be different from what a skier would choose. So who wants to jump in and tell us what poles you're using? And Pear, you want to go? Mitch grabbed his first. Yeah, but he's he's been talking a lot. I've been talking. <laughs> I just have a pair of, uh, I went with Black Diamond Expeditions. Um, yeah. they're, it's a three-piece pole. Um, went with I think they're like five years old and I broke its partner. So now I have an old hiking pole to, to match it. Uh, went with, uh, I like the three piece. It fits on my backpack really nice. Um, and it's an easy repairable thing with duct tape or valet straps. If you break a section, you can just kind of work with it. I was using the carbon or the compactors from Black Diamond forever. And they kind of have a fatal flaw that there's one string basically that holds all three or four pieces together. The really cool part about that is it'll fit in most of your backpacks. So um, as, a, as a snowboarder, although I do ride with poles uh, when it's super deep out, because if you're in the back country and you're just trying to get from one section to the other, it's okay to have, you know, have your poles out. It's, we're, we're totally past that point with snowboarders now. We can be cool with poles. But, uh, but whenever you store them, if you've got too big of a pole and you're trying to ride tight trees, you're constantly getting stuff hooked on you. You just don't want that. So that's where those compactors are really nice. They just fit right into your backpack. But uh, as far as having something that, that is a fix, has a fixable solution out in the backcountry, I'd go with the, the three-piece poles. Nice. Yeah, that's the size difference between the expedition and the compactor. And if you said all the words that I would say, you know, this one fits in your backpack nicely, yep. but I've had it break and friends have broken on that, that, that connection where it's like super loose. These ones are telescoping. They're really sturdy, but yeah, they're going to be in your hands or they're going to be grabbing trees if they're hanging out of your pack. Danny, what are you using for poles this, this season? Compactors. The compactors. compactors. No. Yeah. I just like the fact that you can just throw them in your bag. Super. I actually had the tell the tell ones that like, you know, expanded, um, but they were catching on everything. I one time I like lost one up the hill and that was super annoying. So I had to go get it. So I actually transitioned over to these ones just because I also feel like I, when I first started split boarding, I was like, I don't need poles, <laughs> so I went out without poles, and I'd end up stealing one of my friends and just using one pole. Um, so Aaron and I let a tour cool. last year like that. With tree it's branches. So yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that guy that we tour, that we did a tour with uh, at, at Split Fest last, last season? He's I like, I don't have poles. I'm like, all right, man. <laughs> so grab a tree stick. branch. Yep. <laughs> Definitely makes it a lot more complicated, but yeah. if you have to get by, you can get by. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And Kyle, what are you? Uh, I got Expedition 3s as well. Expeditions? Nice. Yeah, I mean, my pack has, like, ski pole holders on the outside, and it my pack is also huge for camera gear, so it doesn't really cause an issue with getting caught on a tree if if that's an issue. But I, ha I had the compactors before, and they, they broke. <laughs> All right, so how many people have had a compactor pull break on them? The three or four. <laughs> so yeah, it sounds they like they were great for a couple of years. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get yeah, to so use it sounds, like you guys are, just... sounds like you guys are looking for something small that breaks down small, so it gets it gets out of the way when you're on your way down. Um, but then the the expedition is kind of seems like people are moving to the expedition because it's it's a the right combination of small and field yeah has like field serviceability. So. Yeah. I think BCA just released a new pole that breaks down into three zones it's non-telescoping this year the scepter i think is what it's called oh, cool. I, I haven't seen any reviews on it or anything but i've got my my eyes out to see if that one's a saving a little bit stronger than the compactor because that's a good design if it doesn't nice break. <laughs> and do you guys ever use your poles do you guys ever use your poles anytime other than going uphill totally yeah yep yeah. yeah. flats Flats. Yep. Flats. Oh, yeah. Flats. Yeah. Cross country snowboarding was what started split boarding. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Also, that's it's a critical way to get NAR points. You gotta whack some yep. cornices. Yes. Yeah, agreed. Yes. <laughs> nice. 
I've used them for bushwhacking. You know, you go into a certain zone and it just tightens up and it's great to just have some sort of protection so you're not getting smacked in the face. Yeah. Sometimes when you're riding, uh, riding different zones where it'll be steep and then kind of mellow and then steep again, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just ride with them in my trailing hand or ride with one in my trailing hand. Um, for those days where it's super deep out and you just, you know, if, if you go down in it, you're going to be, you're going to be in a, in a thing. Yeah. 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 I can imagine having that one, having one in your hand, if you go down, you have, gives you something to push out, push out. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with that heavy, you got a heavy backpack or your buddy fleet or your buddy's dog Fleetwood is jumping on top of you (laughs) and you can't get them off of you. Shout out Eric. (laughs) Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, I used to snowboard a long time ago and I, I, I definitely remember days. Yeah, you go down, and if you don't at a resort, oh. you have a deep day, and like you got to take your, you got to take your, you got to get out of your board. Yep. Yeah, it's miserable. Yeah, it's not. That's not fun. So cool. All right, what's next? We've got helmets. Uh, where are you guys running for helmets this year? Uh, Danny, let's go. What are you? I'm always the beginning. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, uh, so I have the Anon Raven Mips, and this is just a new helmet for me this year. My helmet last year also got eaten by my dogs. It seems like a trend <laughs> in my gear. <laughs> um, the clip did. Um, one thing that I was looking for with a helmet this year was also easy transition because my hands get really cold during the transition sometimes when it's like those negative like 30 degree days and you're just like, so cold. Um, this one has the magnetic clip, so it's just like really yeah. easy to slip on, which is super nice. Um, and obviously safety, so it's rated really well, and you really want to be safe out there with all the trees. And that country is pretty crazy. So, so every I assume everybody here wears a helmet. <clears throat> yep. Let's, so perfect. All right, Mitch, what are you sporting for a helmet this year? I, I'm due for a backcountry helmet system upgrade. This might be a good conversation. I'm up, I'm open for some tips. So my resort riding, I have a, I don't know what the, the model is. It's a Smith helmet with MIPS, um, the full knit and everything. It's great. But backcountry, I tend to wear, um, I wear my helmet over my hat and goggles when I'm coming down. I store it in my pack on the way up. Um, both of my packs have the little helmet carrying mesh. Right now, I just have a basic shell, just an old burn helmet that I've used for a long time. It's probably beyond the manufacturer's suggested utilization window. Um, but yeah, the reason is that I, when I get to the top, I like to throw a knit hat on and then get everything transitioned. I'm usually kind of guiding the group. So I'm often just quickly getting my vents closed, layers on so I can go help people with their skins, help people figure things out. So being able to like keep the heat in, uh, but not have to throw my whole helmet on and get it all fogged up and everything is critical for me. So then I throw my goggles on on top of that. And then when I'm ready to go, that's the last piece to my kit before I'm ready to go down. I just toss the helmet on, buckle it up and, and I'm good to go. But I'm, it's not the safest helmet. It doesn't have MIPS. It's not super well fitted to my helmet. It jiggles a little bit unless I have my goggles on exactly right. Um, so I, I wear a helmet. It'll keep my skull from cracking if I hit something, but certainly not going to help with any of the um, concussions or sheer things that like MIPS and like a proper fitting knit will help you with. Does, any, does anybody want to quickly expand on what MIPS is? MIPS is uh, a helmet technology that is supposed to rotate inside your helmet, right, Greg? And it kind of... Yeah, there's, there's basically, you've got like, it's like a ball and socket. And so what happens is like, if you, a glancing blow, like if you're at, more at a resort, if you're going really fast and you fall down and your head hits, it like, it breaks apart and dis- distributes that energy from that kind of a glancing blow. So I Personally, I don't know if it's as important in the backcountry. I guess it depends. If you're in some place like Tuckerman Ravine and on a, like a hard icy day, definitely it would be yeah. beneficial there. Uh, but a lot of what we have in, in in Vermont, it's you know probably not super necessary just because it tends to be softer, uh, a little bit lower angle most of the time. Um, so, but yeah, it is a <clears throat> it is it does make the helmet safer. But um, you know, 
necessary, it's hard. You can make that argument. I feel like you can make the argument either way. Like ABS yeah. for your head. Yeah, that's how yeah. someone described it to me and it made sense because <laughs> it's designed to really take, as you come down and like hit the ground, it allows your head to do this without just automatically like shearing yeah. inside. So it's the only concussion reduction technology they have for helmets because helmets aren't designed. That's a big misunderstanding. Helmets are not designed to pr protect from concussions. It's just skull fractures. And um, MIPS is kind of a cool tech, but yeah, I've never had an experience where that's helped. I've seen all the research; it makes sense to me, but I'm not a not an expert on that. I I, I worked with a, a company in when I was living in Minneapolis that did a lot of head trauma things, and we talked about freestyle snowboarding and head injuries and concussions were actually from falling in shear were one of the biggest stats that reported. So interesting to consider how that impacts the backcountry. I have no idea, but still something good to think about. <clears throat> and Kyle, what are you? I've got the same with Mitch, a pretty basic helmet. Uh, it's like the Smith Holt or something. I think it was like 75 bucks at REI. Or it, it works, you know, same idea. Like if I don't have the helmet or the goggles on right, it jiggles a little bit. It doesn't have the magnetic strap that I wish it had. But coincidentally enough, my mountain bike helmet is better than my backcountry helmet. <laughs> what do you uh, but it works. Like I've, I've, you know, I've, cracked my noggin on it a couple times nothing like hard or anything but you know if i didn't have it i'd definitely have something yeah nice and pair uh your helmet this year um sweet protection uh been riding this guy for a couple years now um uh, west end um, i know that helmet <laughs> i've probably i'm pro i really haven't taken any hits on it um but I like to I like to upgrade every couple of years on the helmet and um, just to make sure I do a lot of safety work uh, with my real job nine to five job um, and and I know about like construction helmets and stuff like that and they only have you only have so much longevity and what UV does to the breakdown and stuff like that. Um, that being said, I I think the fit is one of the most important things. You guys both mentioned that your stuff you know, jiggles or something. I am like totally locked in when I put this nice. thing on, like whether I'm riding my goggles up here or in, you know, like I, it is, it is totally a part of me. Um, the other nice thing is it fits really well with, I just, I don't care about goggles that much as long as they're not, you know, busted up and you can see out of them <laughs> that I'm, that I'm riding them and they fit really well with this system. Uh, there's no gaper gap in here at all. You've got like, uh, it's just, it's tight. They don't fog up. The other thing I like about the, uh, the sweet protection helmets is you have uh, a spot for your headlamp right here, doing a lot of night yeah. skiing. You can kind of zip it in right there. And they do a really nice job with, uh, with their venting system. So this year, Oh, and it's also dual rated uh, for for falling rock and debris as well as um, as well as snowboarding, which was really important for me. Um, not just over in Tuckerman, we have plenty of places in Vermont where uh, we've got tight shoots um, yep. that you hike up, and and there's exposure above you. There's ice fall above you, and that was a big concern of mine. I was riding a mountaineering helmet for a while that was providing me with great protection you know from falling objects but not so much um when i was actually riding down so i i'd highly recommend a, a dual rated helmet well, so mitch you mentioned a helmet system because you do have to carry it up and then you have mm -hmm. to put it on and like you have a hat or a buff or something on your head on the way up like what do you guys do? How do you guys like manage all that with your helmet? Like, do you guys have a preferred system or is it just kind of, uh, uh, let's see, Para, like, how about we? I have, a, I have an extremely dialed system for pretty much everything, but yeah. uh, same with this. I have, I've got my favorite uh, balaclava from Outdoor Research. I use the same one. I, I've got tons of buffs, especially uh, in the last year. I've acquired a lot more, uh, but it fits. It fits perfectly. Um, it doesn't take up much space. I like I like the helmet to be very tight fitting, um, so there's not movement going around. And this just gives me um, kind of a little bit more warmth. It kind of just dials, keeps everything, keeps everything right together there. And so you're like, are you letting your helmet do the insulating? Like it seems like Mitch has a beanie underneath, and he's got more of a shell on top. Whereas yeah, you know, I I the helmet's super warm. 
um, in the spring, I'll pop these ear pads out and, and you can go without, you know, without here. And that helps to vent it a little bit. Um, I, I kind of, for a small guy, I run really hot. So I'm constantly trying to figure out how to displace heat. I can once in a while, if we're really gung ho and it's, and it's really dumping, I might keep my helmet on for an uphill, but normally I'll take the second and store it in my pack and, uh, and, and keep going. And Dan, Danny, how about, how about you? What are you, any, uh, any particular helmet kind of management systems for you as you're switching from downhill to uphill or uphill to downhill? Yeah, um, I'm very similar to Per. I put the helmet, um, usually I don't wear my helmet going up because I get really hot as well. So usually I'll wear like a beanie. If it's cold out, I'll wear like a hood for my jacket and kind of like just keep it nice and warm. Um, and then like when I'm like trying to get ready for the transition, usually helmets, one of the things I do more towards the end after like taking off the skins and everything, because you don't want all of your goggles to fog up and whatnot yeah. um so usually i'll throw on that like probably more towards the end of the transition um and i also have for i know we're not talking about goggles yet but we're talking about transitioning and yeah, yeah, yeah. helmets and that kind of goes together um i have the magnetic lenses um these are the anon wm3s and these are super nice um i usually will take off the lenses and have like the lens bag and just put it in my chest until I'm ready, just because fogging is like one of my pet peeves for riding, <laughs> especially if it's dumping snow and there's like snowflakes coming down that are just like hitting you in the eyes. It's like the worst. It can ruin a line. Um, but yeah, I usually, I just have a very basic, simple bag. Um, I got a new bag this year. Last year I had one where the helmet was on the outside. I did like that. This year I just have um, kind of the, just the, one where it rolls up and you can just put everything in it's super simple which i like um it has a couple pockets but yeah sweet and kyle any any additional helmet tips helmet system uh tip? not really i mean I, I go back and forth between wearing a beanie and not sometimes i have a buff and i'll pull a buff over my head before i put the helmet on it kind of depends on the temperature. If it's a super cold day, I'm going to put a beanie on and just kind of stuff my head in. Hopefully it doesn't, you know, fall over my face. If it's a spring day, I'm probably not going to have anything on and I'll just try and tighten my helmet as much as I can. Sweet. So bottom line, have a helmet and wear one. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Every time. Every time. Cool. All right. So let's go. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about goggles next. You know, it's good. Any, does anybody have any particular in our last conversation, the, the takeaway was like, just wear them. Like mm -hmm. you're in the backcountry. There's a lot more, there are a lot more things reaching out and maybe to poke you in the eye. So it's good to have some sort of eye protection. Um, Bring different lenses. Yeah. The weather's going to change. It could be super sunny during the day and then a storm could roll in or the vice, the opposite vice versa. Like it could be a stormy morning and then it's sunny in, uh, in the early afternoon, depending on what time of year it is. Uh, just bring different lenses, put that in your pack. Do you have a, do you have a favorite like when, what, what are you running for goggles this year? And do you have like a favorite lens system? Do you bring, two, the, do you bring uh, two different pairs of goggles or do you bring different lenses? I bring lenses and then I just I have like a little, basically a Ziploc bag and a piece of uh, wax paper to protect them. And I just swap them out. I have the Smith vices, which aren't the best for swapping out. They're not magnetic like Danny's. Um, but I've got like a, a super tinted one for sunny days. And I've got a, uh, I think like a rose colored kind of um, lighter one for, for uh, cloudy days. Nice. Um, Actually, yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Mitch, what are you, you seem like you, you, this is something you might've given a lot of thought to you. <laughs> um, yeah. So I used to run cheap goggles because I thought if I'm going to get whacked in the face by brush all the time, I shouldn't be using expensive goggles, but I found that I just didn't really have that issue, especially snowboarding. Anytime you kind of come up to a tree, you can just put your front arm up and blast through it. And I found that especially in Vermont, um, the weather changes every 10 minutes and you can go from bluebird to being in a snowstorm to being 
caked in with fog within the same hour and a half tour. And so I have the Anon M3s with the magnetic lenses. I feel like I won the lottery living in Burlington at the Burton tent sale and five bucks for a bunch of lenses. So I just like whatever I could carry out, I just bought. So I basically have a lens for every single possible shade and then even have two of the just random like like 15 per or not 15 percent well, i don't know what the percentage is but like the really cloudy days because i know those are the days that i'm going to be blasting snow through trees so i carry i carry all of them not all of them i carry the ones i would potentially need with me in the car like before i leave i just grab like if it's going to be bluebird i grab my like dark dark ones and then ones that would be okay if i'm in the the cover of a tree canopy and then at the parking lot I'm, i decide which one i'm going to bring with me occasionally if i know it's going to change i throw another one that's in a little protective cloth in my bag uh, both of my packs have the fleece lined goggle pockets in them uh, so the goggle without the case sits nicely in there never gets scratched the lens with the little just the cleaning cloth case does the job and uh, seems to work well. And then this year I picked up some Smith um, fly, Wildcat glasses that are, I bought them for mountain biking, but really excited to yeah. ski tour with them. Also the lenses swap out. These are the like clear ones. So I've, I've got those for the snowy days and then some dark ones. So on the way up, uh, no fogging, they sit off your face. So it allows ventilation and allows all your heat to go off. So I'm really excited to test those out in the skin track this year. Cool. Nice. Pair anything to add? I uh, just running a pair of Scots from years ago. They're good <laughs> goggles. Don't remember what a friend of mine gave them to me. But the same with with dual lenses. I keep um, I keep my spare lens in my pack all the time. I have like a like a one for cloudy days. That's actually an auto changer, so it uh, it does it kind of goes between stuff. And then I have a yellow. And I find myself using that yellow constantly because we're yeah. always, if you're in the trees at all, you, you really shouldn't, you can't use that darker lens and, uh, and hopefully it's snowing. So you got to <laughs> have that yellow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, per I personally use the Jilbo. I have a couple pairs of the Jilbo go goggles with the photochromatic lens. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, they're I, feel, I find that they're lightest version that goes from like you can night ski with it with a headlamp or and it gets plenty dark enough for like a bright bluebird day and so cool i kind of appreciate those because they just always have the right you just always have the right lens yeah you'll have to send me the link for those greg <laughs> <laughs> i'm about due <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean they've got some fancy ones but i think they also have some just like mid-range ones that have a uh, that have that photochromatic lens and you just need the like whatever the lightest one is that's the way to go and i you know like anything goggles are one of those things you need to try on yep. make sure it fits your face make sure it fits with your helmet gotta yeah. fit the helmet yeah 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 so those are those are those are considerations as well so when you're you know you're buying goggles so um cool all right let's see we've got last last item we're getting we're running we're gonna see if we can wrap this up before nine <laughs> um, uh, last thing is the pa on our list is the pack to talk about tonight. Um, and so it seems like, you know, a lot of the stuff you guys are carrying and talking about, like also kind of relate to the pa your pack choice. So, um, Kyle, how about you want to share what, what pack are you're, you're kind of a unique, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm a right professional yeah. filmmaker. Oh, I'm a hot professional, but I'm a filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> so I have, I so have the stop. I mean, yeah, so I kind of, <laughs> I have the Tilopa, uh, F-stop Tilopa pack. It's a 50 liter pack, uh, it has aluminum frame similar to like a hiking bag. Right. So it's pretty supportive. Um, it pretty good for multi-day trips. If you're going somewhere, you know, if you're going to Bryant or whatever, um, really good for gear heavy days, especially someone like me, I'm carrying a camera, batteries, lenses, et cetera um weather resistant multiple multiple pockets and even very conveniently because i guess they they market this towards adventure photographers has a skin pouch in the front that is uh thermal so i put my skins in there i don't put them in my jacket and they stay pretty warm and and they get a little melty but they they work um yeah, I mean, it's pretty handy they're not exactly the cheapest pack but for me carrying what probably amounts to 
couple thousand dollars worth of camera gear is pretty important. <laughs> um, on top of that, just something I want to show you guys. If you are watching this and you are a camera person, buy one of these things. I think Greg has something similar. This will fit your camera inside. You can put it in your bag. It also has a little chest mount thing that you can then pop on your chest. I actually use the shoulder strap for my camera and hook it onto there and just have it like how I would if I had my camera out. And that way I can just pull my camera out, shoot, and put it back in. Yeah, those things are sweet. Easy access, keep your, protect your stuff. So that yeah. uh, your pack isn't necessarily a, a snowboard specific pack, but it is pretty uh, It's, it's They a, market it for backcountry skiing and split boarding. Okay. And so yeah, it's yeah I've seen their carry. pictures where their like skis are on it. Sure. Well, and you can carry, and so you can carry a bunch of gear in it, but you can also ditch the kind of camera blocks. Yeah. And yeah, like so you can take the camera pack out. Uh, they make different size ones. They have a small, medium, large, and extra large. So depending on what your trip is going to be will be what you can pack in with your camera. I typically have something that could fit like two or three lenses of camera, uh, batteries. I even somehow magically fit my drone in there and still have all my safety gear. Um, but yeah, you can take that all out. Like if, if I'm just going for fun, I want to bring that pack, I'll take it all out and just put my you know, my extra jackets or layers or whatever I'm putting in there. Nice. Cool. Danny, what are you, you, you mentioned, you brought your pack out just a little bit ago. What are you using this year? Um, yeah. So last year I was actually using this Ergon one. That was really, pretty cool. It had the system on the back that actually moved. So like when you're hiking, it like saves energy and it was off the back a little bit. So it was very breathable. Um, but this year I'm testing out the picture organic one. It's a 26 liter. It's a super simple bag so far. It's pretty easy. I'm not sure I love it for accessibility because you definitely get things on the bottom and you have to like try to get those things out if you're like, I bring my camera often. So I definitely noticed trying to dig out my camera. It was kind of a pain because there's not too many like um, pockets for it. So definitely trying to figure out a pack. I do have the Burton Zoom pack for like those days where I'm really like looking to just do photography and um, filming. But yeah, no, uh, I have a lots of different bags and it's kind of really depending on what I'm doing. So nice. And that, you said that one was 26 liters? Yes. Yep. You, so and do you find cool. that do you find that that's adequate for most days as far as uh, kind of volume goes or yeah, it's, I think it's new this year so yeah it's new this year I've taken it out once to smugs and did actually two day two um rides at smugs with it um but yeah I think it's adequate I don't know for a bigger ride where I'm carrying a little bit more water um if it would have enough space for all my gear and snacks but um for like short trips it's definitely suitable Great. cool uh Danny, if, if you're bringing camera stuff and you need a better camera bag, check out the Cashmere by F-Stop. I think it's a 30 liter. And Burton needs to actually team up with them. I think they made a bag together for a couple of years. I'll check out. I'm always, yeah, d definitely always looking for recommendations. So, and when you like, were like, yeah, check this bag. I was like, noted. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, are there any dog specific things that you have to bring with you for your pups that are oh, really yeah. good back? Do you really want to bring that up right now? Like, oh, so um, yeah, I bring my dogs a lot with me. That's actually really one of the reasons I got into splitboarding was because I wanted to bring my two Siberian Huskies. Um, but there's a few things in my bag for them, particularly Musher Secret is a must. Um, it's like a wax that you put on their fur. So like, you know, how we were talking about the goo, the goo be gone. Or, um, it's pretty much like that, but for their pods. So they don't snowball with that like different, like wet density snow. Um, and then obviously a first aid kit, which we use a first aid kit for ourselves. And it's pretty trans, um, it works for the dogs to a tourniquet. So if you ever slice your dog um, bad, it's definitely a lifesaver if you're out there and you need like, you know, a limb is bleeding. I've had stories of friends, dogs, and they're like, I tell everybody to bring a tourniquet. So tourniquet, and then um, obviously a collapsible bowl for water because water's not accessible out there and they do get thirsty just like us um, and lots of treats. <laughs> awesome. 
Uh, Mitch, what are you, what are you, what, what pack are you running this year? I have two different packs. Um, I have a Burton Incline 20 liter, and then I have an Osprey Camber 32 liter. And the 20 liter Burton pack um, is the one I use the most. Uh, almost everything packs away. Like it all like stuffs inside of itself. So when I'm just doing those morning Dawn Patrol laps, going up for just one quick lap, it's great. My tip trick, uh, so this one does not have a back like entry. It's like, it's just the zippers on the front here. Uh, the Osprey one, you can lay the pack down, zip it and open the back and, and get into it. Um, I actually don't use the back access all that much except for the really long days when we're taking a long break to eat lunch or really rest up but all my packs i throw all my zippers to the right hand side and put them all in the bottom so as i'm skinning when i need to get something i just throw it off to my side and i use it and i just access from the bottom corner i know where everything is i layer everything this way in my pack because that's how i found that i just get into everything and I found that that saves me from needing to have the issue of the, like why most people buy the back access pack. Cause they're like digging in, they can't find their gear. For me, these, all these packs zip all the way to the bottom. So they're great, but I love the Burton incline. Um, yeah, awesome for those really short tours and the Canberra one's good for the long days. I don't do any overnight stuff. Um, I just doesn't fit into my current lifestyle. I, I used to do that and I had a much larger pack. I had a 42 liter for those ones to pack a sleeping pad and sleeping bag and gear and stuff. But these ones are awesome for around here. I have transitioned from bladders to like insulated containers for water. I just heard too many horror stories from big mountain avalanche terrain friends having bladders freeze in the back country lugging a bunch of weight punctures having everything wet while they're like also trying to navigate snowpack and ever-changing weather conditions so i now just use like a 28 liter tall hydro flask uh the burton pack has a little zipper on the side that allows this little mesh thing to slide out just throw it in there can grab it right from like a whole stair drink it put it away and when i get to the top stuff it in it's completely out of the way and, and nice and warm nice <clears throat> That's awesome. Para, what are you, what, what pack are you running? Uh, been using the Osprey Camber 42. Um, I like it. I use it every day. I use it if I'm just going to make a lap on Suicide 6 for 600 feet or if I'm going to go over to Tuckerman for the weekend. Um, I, it, I like how it distributes the weight. I can't really explain that. It, the, the way that the straps and the hip belt and the whole system of, of that Osprey pack work, uh, it's it feels like nothing's nothing's there, even when you've got it totally loaded. I would prefer having a larger pack and cinch it down to, as opposed to having a smaller pack and it'd be totally blown up. Uh, I, I was rocking a black diamond Dawn patrol, like 20 some liter there for a while. And I was finding between water and my first aid kit and, you know, some extra layers and stuff. It was just like a balloon. And uh, I like I like how this Osprey actually rides with me um, and skins with me for that matter on the way up. I, I got to say one more thing is the 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 uh, back access. It has like a like Mitch was talking about the whole back panel zips off. And for me, that's huge up at the top of the line. I'll just dump the pack off and then zip that whole thing and I can get in, get whatever I need out of there. And I'm putting my skins in my jacket anyway, so I'm really not accessing any other part of the pack except for that uh, back panel. And I can kind of lay everything out in there, water, first aid kit, layers, and it's just kind of all right there for me. Nice. <clears throat> and so what, and what, sorry, what size pack was that? It's like a 42 30, liter. 42 liter. Yeah. yeah. So I, it, it sounds bigger than what it is. So you start putting some extra valet straps and a pair of sunglasses and, you know, it, it gets there. Totally. Yeah. I mean, in our previous discussion, we've, we kind of settled on like 35 to 40 liters as being kind of like the sweet spot. If you're going to have like one backcountry pack, like yeah, that's enough to go. Yeah. Like you were saying, you can cinch it down for like a Dawn Patrol, but if you're going out all day, you have plenty of space for uh, extra layers, food, you know, safety gear. If you're headed up into an area with heavy terrain, yep. you know, so stuff like that. Uh, quick question about um, what about like carry options on, your pack does it do you guys consider does that a con consideration at all yeah definitely i when i was first 
buying packs. I mean, we start in the early season here. Uh, I'll start with my rock board, which is not a split board. And uh, <laughs> I got to carry, I got to hike up a certain mountain around here up the access road. And you just, if you know, you got to have something to put that, put that board on dragging yeah. that board up is, is tiring. So I would, I would say um, definitely want the, definitely want the full snowboard carry but I've also really like uh, I like the A frame uh, in the spring when I'm going on bigger hikes over in the whites. I'll A frame the split board, maybe put my boots on there too. And the way that that all distributes the weight, it just doesn't drive it straight down like it does if you hang that off your back there. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, you got to have options. Yeah, yeah. Packs have come a long ways for a lot of those features. I remember searching for my first pack in 2008, trying to find a pack that would carry skis and a snowboard, and I couldn't find one anywhere. I ended up finding this great pack at EMS that I used for a decade, and it's still in great shape. One of my buddies is touring with it now, and it was the only pack I could find that had vertical, horizontal, and A-frame carries, and now it's like every pack you find has them all because splitboarding has just become a little bit more normalized in the industry and it's yeah it's critical i mean especially the days like even like up here riding stow like you want to boot pack up to the top and the slushy days you you got to a frame yeah. to to make it up some of that stuff and and then if you're ever going on snowmobile tours or anything like that you want to have that vertical carry so you can comfortably stand or sit on the sled and then if you're hiking or boot packing you want that you know vertical carry so that you're not clipping trees up a up a path you know going up to to hojo's or something like that so yeah mm -hmm. <clears throat> nice uh any any other pack tips at this point covered it up mm -hmm. nice any other any other general tips just for people getting into you know ski straps, fully straps. <laughs> fully straps. Fully straps. Fully straps yeah like i'm talking a dozen minimum <laughs> time to put them on your holiday wish lists if you sell yeah them. <laughs> you'll be the savior of the tour if you're with people if you have like 10 to 12 of them because someone's going to inevitably have a binding issue a pole issue or something yeah i like make sure you, uh make sure you buy them long enough too i feel like yes no by very the ones the ones that like hold your skis together or something aren't long enough you need more you need, you need the long ones. Yeah, I've I've definitely strung a couple together, you know, in a yeah. row. That, yeah, <laughs> totally. yeah they, can hold a, they can hold a skin on, or I mean, I don't know. You could. There's, there's a million options. Cool. All right. Well, extra parts. Always yeah. bring extra parts. <laughs> yeah. High backs, whatever you got, just bring them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you guys need a sled. Bring your yes. dog. <laughs> Hi, bud. Yeah, bring your dog. <laughs> yeah. Bring your dog. <laughs> oh, great. Well, yeah, if, if nobody has anything else to add, I think we can we should wrap this up. Um, I just want to thank everybody here for you know tuning in for joining us and sharing, you know, your experience and um spending you know almost close to two hours here talking with us um and sharing your tips. Um we do have, this is the second episode in a series of five episodes we have going. Next week, we're going to be talking about like XC, like Nordic touring, backcountry touring equipment, which may or may not like strike a note with this cr this crowd. Uh, but then after that, we are going to be doing, uh, we're going to be doing, talking about clothing strategies, dressing for the backcountry. And then uh, following that, we're going to be <clears throat> doing a what's in your pack. And so what we'll actually do is we'll kind of like go through, a, we'll have everybody go through their packs and see like, what do you typically take on? Uh, a, a normal tour uh, and we'll get into like snacks and what's in your repair kit and what's in your uh, first aid kit, stuff like that. So tune in the next few weeks. Um, and there, you know, those things are, those are up on the Catamount Trail website. They're up on our YouTube channel already. So you can see when they're scheduled um, and we'll hopefully we can keep sharing information with you guys and help everybody have a great experience this year. Um, so, yeah. Check out the Cadmount Trail website at cadmounttrail.org. Uh, become a member, uh, make a donation, uh, and use some of our use some of our the train here in Vermont if if you can travel here. So, yeah. cool. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so awesome. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care, guys. All right. We are now not live.